In this lecture, we're going to be looking at the eight theories and models of persuasion covered in your textbook. Persuasion was initially studied during World War I in studies of war propaganda. As time passed, researchers in a variety of fields, including psychology, sociology, and communication, have devised a variety of theories and models that explain persuasion. Our first theory is stimulus response theory. This is a rather simplistic model that focuses on the relationship between a stimulus and a response. It goes back to early research by Ivan Pavlov, in which he conducted experiments with dogs. Each time he would give the dog a morsel of food, he would ring a bell. Soon, the sound of the bell alone was sufficient to make the animal salivate. Individuals, much like dogs, may learn what they need to do to obtain favorable rewards and avoid unfavorable outcomes. This is called conditioned responses. Cialdini expanded on this notion by arguing that conditioning pre-programs scripts that guide our behavior. These scripts are mental shortcuts that allow us to make everyday judgments without spending a lot of energy or mental capacity on them. An example of a script might be that if a product is expensive, we may assume that it must be a higher quality or confer a higher social status than a similar product offered at a lower price. In stimulus response theory, we assume that attitudes that are rewarded grow stronger and those that are opposed become subject to change. Advertising uses stimulus response in messages that link positive outcomes with specific products that power of association. Our second theory is also quite simple. Inoculation theory predicts that a persuader who delivers a warning about a future message that may contain conflicting information can inoculate an audience from the message's persuasive effects. So in short, inoculation can promote resistance to opposing persuasive efforts. With inoculation theory, the most important aspect is to be among the first to expose an individual to an idea or a behavioral request. Our third theory is attribution theory. Attribution theory attempts to explain how people account for the actions of others when making decisions about persuasive messages. We make attributions about other people's motives, the causes, or the reasons for their behavior. Attributions affect the salience or perceived importance of the message to a receiver. Not all attributions are voiced, but they're always a subtext for what we're thinking. Because we're always calculating the perceived motives of the source. There are two classes of attributions. The first are situational attributions, factors in the environment that we believe may cause people to act in certain ways. And then there are positional attributions. These are more internal or personal factors that we believe uh, cause people to behave in certain ways. The problem that we may have with attribution theory though is its ambiguity. There's no certainty that we're making the correct interpretation of another individual's motives. And attribution theory may also encourage us to oversimplify other people's behaviors. So, before we use attribution theory to make a serious decision, we should stop and ask ourselves if we're actually interpreting another person's actions correctly. One of my favorite theories of persuasion is consistency theory, or cognitive dissonance theory. Cognitive dissonance theory is based on our expectation of consistency. It assumes that imbalance can produce change. Because individuals who feel uncomfortable with inconsistency in their lives will work to reduce discrepancies between previously held attitudes and behaviors and new information they may receive. So basically here's how cognitive dissonance theory works. First of all, I reveal an inconsistency to you that can produce a sort of psychological discomfort or tension that we call dissonance. That dissonance then motivates you to 
do something to put yourself back in balance or achieve consonance. And in that process, uh, you may make a change. The magnitude of the dissonance varies depending on the strength of the belief and the importance of the attitude or behavior to you. And there are four variables that can influence the magnitude of dissonance. First of all, the importance of a given decision. Secondly, the attractiveness of the choice that you've made. Third, the perceived attractiveness of the alternative that maybe you didn't choose. And less dissonance or relief will be perceived when we're really talking about two things that are very similar anyway. Dissonance is reduced, according to this theory, when our attitudes or behaviors are changed to help us re-achieve that sense of consonance. Persuaders identify and express inconsistencies in an attempt to create that dissonance and thereby to create attitude or behavioral change. Of course, like most of the theories we've discussed so far, there is a potential problem with cognitive dissonance theory. Due to our capacity for compartmentalization, we sometimes bypass this whole theory by simply denying that there's dissonance in our lives. Denial is then what we use to reconcile without actually reconciling our discrepant attitudes. Now an interesting variation of dissonance theory is the theory of induced discrepant behavior. In this theory, requesting a new behavior from an individual is expected to create that dissonance gap that prompts the individual to reject their prior attitudes and ultimately to make a behavior change. The thinking is that when we willingly take on a new behavior it actually becomes part of our identity and as a result we can use that to replace older attitudes that no longer match the new behavior. Of course you can't force someone to take on a new behavior in fact, the stronger the threat of force, the less dissonance a person is likely to experience. Furthermore, there's no internal inconsistency if two concepts are perceived as unrelated or if a person's attitude toward two concepts are already similar. Likewise, there's no dissonance if a behavior and a previous attitude are already in alignment. Further, since there's no simple direct relationship between individual attitudes and actual behavior, it's difficult to predict how much dissonance will be produced by any given action. The example on the slide here suggests one reason why people who quit smoking sometimes become really vociferous opponents of smoking. Uh, and this ad takes advantage of this idea that if I can just get a person to be a quitter for one day, I've got a better chance of persuading them to quit tomorrow and the next day and the next day until finally the consonant attitude is, I'm not a smoker. We do have some other possibilities for dealing with cognitive dissonance. One possibility is to simply dismiss the source of the conflicting information. We can also go out and try to find new supportive or consonant information to kind of bolster our current attitude. We also weight the information that we receive so that weighting some information as more valid than other information can also reduce our sense of dissonance. Of course, we talked before about overt denial of dissonant information. Sometimes we bolster our current attitudes with excuses or rationalization that explains our behavior. Or we may try differentiation in which we show that, well, the ideas are really not similar at all so that the perception of the dissonance simply disappears. Self-concepts and the potential that we may have for rewards or punishments can also influence our perceptions about cognitive dissonance. Our sixth theory is really less a theory than an outcome. The boomerang effect acknowledges that some persuasive efforts actually produce the opposite effect from what was intended. 
not only does the audience reject the persuasive appeal, but they may actually move farther away from the desired outcome than they were before the persuasive message was sent. Now messages can boomerang for many, many reasons. Three important reasons include the fact that persuaders sometimes ignore the needs or values of the target audience. Sometimes persuaders offend their audiences. And sometimes they use appeals or arguments that are simply too obvious or clumsy. In other situations, there's really no way to tell what causes a particular audience or a particular individual to boomerang away from the intended effect. Our seventh theory, social judgment theory, postulates that people do not evaluate persuasive messages based only on the merit of the message itself. Rather, social judgment theory suggests that people compare arguments against their current attitudes before deciding if they should accept an advocated position. So that current attitudes become crucially important as they serve as reference points or anchors for our evaluation of persuasive messages. Now, we may see similar things as more similar than they really are when we're making these comparisons. And when this happens, we're having an assimilation effect. This occurs when we find attitudes that match our anchor points and we assimilate them more readily than we might otherwise do. The contrast effect is just the opposite. We may see dissimilar things as more dissimilar than they really are. Ego involvement is an important influence in social judgment theory. We can think of our attitudes and beliefs as existing on a kind of continuum in which there's a range of acceptable positions, a range of neutral feelings, and a range of unacceptable positions. Because our current beliefs serve as internal anchors, they create sort of latitudes of acceptance that allow us to actually accept a wide range of positions. When we have low ego involvement, we can have a wide latitude of non-commitment. We can be persuaded, perhaps by messages that are perceived as similar to our existing attitudes. Ego involvement expands or contracts our latitude of rejection, though, which are positions that we consider to be absolutely unacceptable. What this ends up meaning is that people who are highly involved can become very difficult to persuade. Messages here tend to reinforce our existing attitudes or positions and therefore may lead to the boomerang effect we talked about a moment ago. Therefore, it's essential for us to know where the latitude of acceptance ends and where the latitude of rejection begins. Our final theory, the elaboration likelihood model, focuses on the assumption that people are motivated to hold correct attitudes. Elaboration refers to the extent to which a person really thinks about the issue relevant arguments contained in a persuasive message. Under this model, individuals are expected to use one of two different processing methods. The first method, peripheral processing, occurs whenever receivers employ simple decision rules to evaluate persuasive messages. Decision rules rules can be related to things like communicator credibility, their expertise, their likability, their attractiveness, maybe their stereotypes, or other general rules of thumb. So for example, if you hear a health message from a doctor, you might decide, if you're using peripheral processing, that the message is probably true because doctors should know lots of things about health. The other process is central processing. And in central processing, we employ a much more thoughtful analysis. We use critical thinking to assess the individual arguments that are presented in the message. When messages are processed centrally, receivers very carefully examine the information, the arguments or logic, and the proof that's provided. And with central processing, attitude change tends to be more permanent 
and a more reliable predictor of future behavior.